Good afternoon, everyone. I'm James Glasscock. I run a company called Elephas Ventures. I'm super excited to be here with you today moderating this panel on successful crypto investing. I've got uh, an incredible panel of one, two, three, four, five uh, superstars, and I'm going to let them introduce themselves and we'll jump right into it. So let's start with you, Kavita. Hi. Uh, were you really actually counting one, two, three, four, five, or you just did it? I just did it right there. <laughs> Magic. <laughs> Use the blockchain. <laughs> first killer app. Uh, verification first. <laughs> Hi, my name is Kavita. I lead Consensus Ventures uh, based out of between SF and New York. Uh, we have offices around 33 country offices from Consensus, five for ventures, and we invest both in equity and tokens. Uh, Chase Hero. Uh, come from the tech world, built a bunch of algorithms and software that we use in the securities world, morphed them to an ecosystem in the crypto world, done very well on it, and we like to help people focus. Uh, a lot of money, a lot of smart moves to be made here, but a lot of people are making the opposite. So if we can help there, successful day. Hi, I'm Jay Blasky. I work for BitIRA. Um, we like to think of ourselves as kind of the bridge between uh, traditional old finance, uh, funds such as retirement accounts, and people that want to experience cryptocurrency and take that first dip and actually get into the market. So we facilitate uh, IRA 401k moves with actual cryptocurrency tokens. Hi, my name's uh, Adam Strzok. It says Strzok Capital over there, which is uh, our venture fund. Our crypto open-ended evergreen hedge fund is called DDC, Divergence Digital Currency. Um, we would we consider ourselves sort of like a Gen 2 crypto fund where um, we have true sort of diversification of strategies because we understand that um, there's been a lot of sort of macro regime changes. So we focus um, on pre-sales, incubation, um, and quantitative uh, as well. Um, great. Let's jump in. So cr a successful crypto investing can mean a lot of different things to different people. Um, Adam, I'd like to start with you and let's talk about uh, incubation, pre-sale, uh, post uh, trading of liquid tokens, and uh, I think we'll sort of pivot into the IRA stuff right after that. Uh, Adam, go ahead. Yeah, so Break I think for down. us, um, when we were choosing as venture investors to sort of take a, a real right turn and get into the crypto on an institutional level, um, we noticed that a lot of the like Gen 1 or Gen 0 crypto, fund, crypto funds were separating their strategies out on a fund by fund basis. And, you know, while that is a ni maybe a very nice way to um, you know, aggregate more capital or get more management fees. Um, from our perspective, we didn't we didn't really understand that because when you're dealing with um, a nascent asset class that can experience rapid um, sort of macro changes, you know, and on a week to week or month to month basis, it, it becomes very hard to have like an ICO fund where all you're doing is ICO investing. Um, so for us at DDC, uh, we focus specifically on not just ICO or pre-sale investing, um, but also you know, incubation and also our quantitative strategy. So um, the way that we define sort of pre-sale investing is, and for our fund, we're backed by uh, Huobi, which is one of the largest exchanges in the world. Um, so the, the pre-sale game is, is something that we can do really well. You, you're a thematic investor, you identify a company that you think is gonna have liquidity in the near term, and you can sort of play that whole game of getting in and sort of riding that wave. Um, and that may work when everybody is very bullish, but in a bear market, um, it becomes harder. So for us, um, we focus a lot now on incubation, which we define as sort of finding core technology innovation, bringing that to the crypto space as a sort of thematic investor, and then helping them with everything. So we're taking equity because we want to be long-term um, partners, and we want to help them with you know, business development, talent acquisition, media marketing, PR, exchange listing, sort of the, the whole gamut. So. Um, Two, two, uh, two speakers before us, uh, John Linden spoke for Mythical. That was one of the projects that we uh, incubated. And you know, we really enjoy that because we can sort of uh, get really deep and, uh, and dive in with these companies for the long term. Well, let me just do a quick poll. Uh, how many folks in the audience are involved in a project that you're raising money for right now or have raised money in the last 12 months? Wow. OK, so I'd say maybe that's 40% of the room-ish. Uh, how many folks in the room are kind of focused on trading? trading liquid tokens today. Okay, maybe that's 10, 15%. Okay, um, very helpful, thank you. Um, Kavita, how do you guys think about it at Consensus and where are you prioritizing your efforts given we're kind of now in this, I don't know, eight month long bear market? Uh, unclear when that'll change. Yeah, so 
I think this market is very, very dynamic. And with this market, you have to keep on changing your investment thesis. When we started early last year, we were going, the tokens prices were going up. Like every month people were showing us, like my peers from other funds were like 8x returns, 10x returns, especially the Asian market. And we were focusing really to build technology. So going into equity and telling people, if you really don't have a legitimate case of having a token, really use of it where we see that people like my parents would ever go and actually start using it. There's that much requirement for it. Don't do tokens. But at that point of time, everybody thought, oh, you're coming from a traditional background, so maybe you're not getting it. So we kept on going. We changed a little. We did some of the tokens uh, by the end of the last year. And then we started seeing a lot of changes this year. And I think uh, the whole thesis which everyone was coming together is like, why do companies need billion dollars to start creating one financial product? Or why do companies based on white paper need $30 million to just start? And uh, a lot of them, I, I would say 92 to 94% of them actually ended up doing nothing. And we are still waiting for the product after a year or two year. And they can show that they have uh, a burn rate with that money. But we really didn't see like that couldn't be done with a 500k or a million dollar equity raise. So this year, we see a big market shift starting from March or April, where a lot of entrepreneurs themselves started coming and saying, OK, let's do the pre-seed or seed round in equity. And over time in the future, we'll do tokens. Because anyways, if they don't going to do tokens, it's not going to be 10, 15, 20 million dollar raise. And now, starting from August, September, we have started seeing this huge rush towards security token. Though I think as of now, based on ATS, there are only two to four places throughout US who can actually launch security tokens. But now people are suddenly starting uh, going towards it. So the overall thesis, actually, the equity part continued as a uh, as a constant piece, but now we are going and saying, hey, we're going to go and do equity. If you ever do token in the future, we will have an option to map our equity into tokens if tokens do become your main revenue source. And if not, most of the tokens, I think utility tokens at least, are going to move towards the fiat back tokens because of all the legislation rules still the world doesn't become clear about it. What's the size of rounds you're seeing? So I think one of the things I'm hearing is equity maybe tokens yeah. uh, in the future. What's the size of the seed rounds that you're seeing kind of getting traction with investors, yourself and others right now? I'm asking that question because especially for the folks that are in the audience that are building, uh, you know, I've seen a couple of projects that are out seeking uh, $100 million or $50 million. Is that the right ballpark, or should they be focused in a different ballpark for I seed round? $50 million at seed or CDs, a both sounds very off because that's completely growth and you should have a lot of traction for it. So one of the most successful companies in our portfolio, BlockFi, uh, we did a very early pre-seed round completely based on their deck. Uh, that was their, uh, I think, a $1 million round at that point of time. Um, and we went as a lead investor. And today, I, it's been like 10 months down the road. And they are doing pre-Series A round between like a convertible note. And even then, they are doing anywhere between 20 to $30 million cap while they have a $50 million lending pool in their bank account. So I think the entrepreneurs who are smart and who knows like slowly and slowly show the product and then go up instead of creating and hype and going up, uh, they are doing it the round, right way. Uh, our biggest check has been to somebody doing $25 million valuation round for $3 million raise. So I think that's the right space pre-series A. Great, thank you for that. So I think I wanna just reiterate that. I heard one to $3 million is the right numbers to be thinking about uh, if you've got a seed stage project with just a DAC, nothing really proven uh, thus far. So if you're out with a $20 million ICO and a white paper, you're probably, uh, you're gonna be on thin ice. Um, Let's switch gears. Chase, uh, tell us about wh where you see the opportunities right now for successful crypto investing. Well, first, who here doesn't have crypto? Who here owns zero crypto? People are lying if that's had that many hands aren't up. All right. The hackers so, in the room. I know, right? <laughs> um, so first and foremost, that's amazing. So for us, I believe that there's a million different avenues that can be uh, capitalized here. And the first thing is understanding the market you're in. Being self-aware is key. 
Um, things like Coinbase's ease of use actually scared me in the detriment that it caused on people because it was so quickly for uneducated people to get their money into a field they knew nothing about. Um, your mom or your aunt at Christmas told you, and a month ago she was borrowing 50 bucks from you. So I believe that being self-aware in the environment you're in will make it very easy. And also understand who you're playing against. Um, I believe success is brought it being focused. Who here holds more than five tokens in their wallet? Okay, so that's a problem I personally see. Uh, I, we've created an algorithm and a code that uses uh, Oracle pieces all over the world. Like they were saying, if a CEO is 18 years old and raises 30 million, I track now where he eats, where he lives, who he hangs out with because it lets me know this information. I truly believe the outpouring amount of information out there makes this very difficult to trade multiple or invest in multiple utilities or securities or you know, whatever you want to call them in this scenario. Um, educated, meaning how, what bandwidth are you putting in each one of these projects? There's a lot of things going on here in a world that's very unregulated, so there's a lot of hope in there. I break it down so people can understand it. Who here trick-or-treated when they were a kid? Who knew their neighborhood and who had the king size snicker bars at that house, <laughs> right? That was your neighborhood, first place you went. You got off your ass and you went right to that house. You're like, mom, I got him. That should be crypto. I trade Bitcoin. I've been trading Bitcoin for 18 months now. You know, we've turned 400,000 into over 40 million. And with the one simple thesis understanding, we know what we're doing. We know the field we play on, so we know the variables that are there because there are a million of them that you have no idea. We're watching it happen every day. Like, I can't express this enough. Someone raises $300 million. They had no money. How incentivized are they to build the project that you gave them money for, that you don't hold equity? Um, so for me, I believe that education, this space is interesting to me for the sense that so many people got in, like, I got 10 grand ready to invest. I'm like, well, what do you know? I don't know shit. Well, why haven't you taken the time, gone to events, gone to the right people to get information so you're educated? If you have $10,000, you know nothing about crypto, maybe put a grand in it and spend $9,000 understanding the in industry you're about to go into. Knowledge will be 100% key. I'm proven fact of it. I grew up in poverty. I went to prison at a young age. I have never been predestined to be better than anybody at this. I had a typewriter in college. I just understand human emotions and human interactions. And when you push it to an edge, when you want hope, people will move. What are the longest lines we see right now? The lottery, 1.6 billion, every gas station in America? Isn't that hope? Hope driving us. Knowledge will make sure you know what you are doing. In our arena, hope makes you go broke. Um, and if, you, if that's the realm you're trading on, please, I'll give you my crypto wallet. You can just give it to me because we'll get it anyways. But please, be educated. <laughs> Being here right now, it's not going anywhere. Will it change and morph a bunch of times? Sure. But it's not going underwear. If you understand economics, macroeconomics, world economy, this is needed. So just get in there, get your money in there, put it on a paper wallet, put it on a a ledger, whatever these things are, and just sit there and get educated. Stop freaking out if something goes like this and that. And if you are freaking out, you got way too much money in the game. No sound investor wakes up in the morning going, oh, or, oh. they just don't. They pivot themselves and understand what the market is giving them. So just please, like, stop letting guys like me win on the backs of other <laughs> people. Like, I, I, I'm just being real. Like, I, listen, I love money. I'm a capitalist. But the only way this goes to shit is if the bandwidth of every single person is burnt to nothing because of guys who know what they're doing are using that to their advantage. We need regulation. Anybody who says we don't, I'm sorry, is you are wrong. Because we need it. You don't want guys like me buying 30% of your company, trading it, shorting it, moving it all around. Because I'm a capitalist, it's presumptuous for me to do that. So. Chase, I, I love that sort of key theme around focus. Uh, yesterday, I spent some time with Mark Weinstein, who was a few panels before me, and uh, he said something I thought was really key. Um, it, w w in this crypto space, we sometimes we, we get a little ahead of ourselves, and we think crypto is moving faster than everything else in the world. 
Um, but it's really not. It's not moving faster than AI. It's not moving faster than machine learning. And, and I loved what Mark said. He said, there's just so much noise out there. Uh, and I think what I'm kind of picking up from you is you've just focused on a signal. One signal. A lot of signals related to it, but your signal is Bitcoin. And, and I really respect that. I, I think it is a great takeaway uh, for anyone here at the conference around focusing and going very deep. Um, it's a multi-decade journey, not just a couple of years. And, um, I, and I, like other, I like other coins, but I'm self-aware. You know, I run a tech company. I have a lot of other projects. So for me to dive into something that I'll give 10% of myself, who here is going to give up money that they put 10% of effort to? You ever go to a dinner and eat 10% of your food? How'd you feel about that? It's a waste, right? I see that and it scares me. Like we, you, there, there, there should, there's a big disconnect of who should be winning and who's not. And I can promise you it should not be me that's winning in this scenario. It should be people who understand what's happening here. If you think the man is going to distort this, they're already here. So Jay, let's, let's cut over to you and mm -hmm. jump into crypto, uh, I'm sorry, retirement accounts mm -hmm. and what you're working on and what, you know, I, I think a year ago I, I did it myself with the Bitcoin IRA. I was curious how that process would work. I think three weeks later I finally figured it out and, <laughs> you know, there's some, uh, some, some Bitcoin and some other tokens, but tell us about where you're prioritizing in the space. So just to chase this point, first thing out, out the gate, I'd say I agree with you 100% on regulation. We were the first company in the next, we, we set up about 14 months ago. Um, we were the first people, you don't need any regulatory authority to do what we do, which is basically create a turnkey solution for people who have retirement accounts that are looking long term, that are not looking to, to trade on the minute by minute, they're just, they're interested in the space and they want to go long term. We went to uh, a section of the Department of the Treasury, FINRA, and we registered. We were the first people out there pushing that pro-regulatory approach. Our trading platform, SEC, FINRA, New York Bit License. The more of that we see, I think the better it is because that confidence that people can gain from knowing that what they're partaking in isn't this just black box and they're not just throwing money at something that they heard someone talk about and crossing their fingers because they want to be on the crest of the wave. Um, we, we work with a limited number of tokens. Um, we work with partners that we recognize. Um, and what we're really trying to do is, I don't want to make it too easy access to your point. It shouldn't be something that someone can wake up in the middle of the night drunk and, and press a button and do. But we literally, we guide people through that process. They have a, an old 401k. They understand the space. They want to make a long-term play. Retirement accounts are the perfect vehicle because there's a lot of capital tied in there that they can't take out. It simplifies a lot of the tax questions that people have because when you buy, sell, or trade inside of retirement accounts, this isn't a taxable event. So we kind of were one of the pioneers on, on creating this process and allowing people to get into cryptocurrency in a sensible manner um, and, and make a, what we would think to be a longer term play simply because that's the best way to do it. We, uh, we do eight tokens, we don't go near, we get a lot of requests on information on some altcoins, some ICOs, and I ask the same question. What do you know? Where did you hear this from? And how long are you looking to experience this? And some people just heard someone else made some money and that's enough. And they're looking at taking retirement funds and just throwing it down on the table. It shouldn't be a casino because if you're entering the casino, you're probably gonna walk out broke. Um, and, and we're making a long-term play, and we're just happy to be in the space helping people do this securely. What's the, what's the profile of the users that are looking at taking their retirement accounts and putting some of that in crypto? So there's, there's two broad profiles. There's either someone in their 30s or 40s that now actually will work in the space. They've got an old 401k. Um, that they, they don't like the equities market. They don't like the options. 401ks are even more restricted than a traditional IRA. They've got a choice of funds and they don't like it and they don't like the fees they're paying and they want to get into, involved in cryptocurrency. Or we deal with a lot of high net worth individuals that are of a certain age. And what they're doing is that they're placing a trade into cryptocurrency in one of the bigger cryptos and they're going to use it as a barometer. They're going to use it to see, to learn about the market, to learn about what are the factors that are involved in they, they know what they know and they know what they don't know. And that's the most important part, that they, they don't go crazy heavy in this because they, they want to get in and they just want to do it in a measured manner with a company that they can trust. And that, that's what our, our strategic strength is 
pre, our sister company's been around for 14 years. They do close to $100 million a year in other alternative assets. Um, and it's that they're looking for. They're looking for that long history, that safety and security, and someone that's not going to be here today, gone tomorrow. And that's what I think we do best in the industry. So on that, you know, I want to actually deep dive back into the builders group because it was a pretty large swath of hands that went up on that. Um, and it seems like, you know, what we've gotten in the last year, uh, obviously a lot of ICOs have happened, a few blockchains have launched. Um, and those white papers were based on some game theory around how they thought users might behave in the ecosystem. And, and in some cases, uh, it hasn't proven out. So uh, I'd like to start with you, Kavita, and then jump over to Adam. Um, what are you advising your builders, your entrepreneurs? How, what's the right sequencing for thinking about product market fit before memorializing some game theory in an in a inflexible technology like blockchain? Um, what's the right way to sort of sequence these things? Because just to sort of recap, I think a year ago, the, the narrative around ICOs where we're going to do two things. One is we're going to launch the token ecosystem with users. And two, we're going to fund the growth of that ecosystem. What we actually seem to have done is uh, um, uh, we got some tokens in the hands of a lot of folks who just flipped them for profit. Um, we haven't got the products yet in many cases. Um, and we hope to grow those ecosystems, but you know, in fact, some, some, some people spent their money or Ethereum went from 1,000 to 200 and there's no money left. So um, I'd really like to kind of you know, take a breath and then re-engage around uh, what's the right way to carefully build this now that the, the craze is over and, and there probably will never be another 2017 again. Go ahead, Kavita. Um, I think on the protocol layer, people still need to uh, give their tokens and then need money to fund the ecosystem. Because at the protocol layer product or the new blockchain, they need to have adopters and they need to provide incentives for those adopters to come online. So we still have some of the protocols we invested into who raised 20, 30 million last year, but their idea was that 20, uh, 20 million out of 30 million is going to go towards getting a lot of developers on that platforms to start building. I think that concept somewhere is still valid. We still hear a lot of that today. I'm not sure if that's going to be that amount of dollars. Or like already, as you said, the prices are down. So like what's going to happen? The biggest problem with the network effect is today is how many of us are ready to put our ethers into buying a token thinking that this token is going to give me some sort of a value which is not speculative, which is more utility. And every product which so far has come can be done in USD or a fiat currency. So why should I lock a speculative currency on it? And now, because as you said, from 1,000 to 200, we are facing that more and more and more. So the only product, at least in our portfolio, which we have seen super successful with the circulation of tokens have been Quanstar. But again, that's developers. So most of the developers who want their smart contracts to be audited, uh, they come and they use Ethers or they use the Quanstamp token, but then they are already sitting on a lot of crypto from a long time, most of them. So it's a very educated niche group which is circulating. Apart from that, a general user or like most of the people out here, if you are not a developer but you have bought Ethers or Bitcoin, probably won't block their ethers and Bitcoin for any of the tokens today. What, what stars were aligned for Quantstamp to get to successfully get their tokens in the hands of a distributed community? Was it just timing or did they have a great marketing campaign or a way of seeding the tokens? I think combination of four things. First, the team was really, really outstanding. When the projects were coming with just a white paper from a lot of people who have never built the team, here you have entrepreneurs who are techn technologically very smart and also have turned around two companies and like they had, they already had their product by the time they went. They went through Y Combinator, had their whole MVP, had their thought process out before they launched the token. Of course, they launched their tokens in December 2017. So. Uh, that really helped them out, which was one of the highest peaks. Uh, the third thing is like they had a developer team of 17 to 18 people already to show. So it's not like two people are building it and going to figure it out. And fourth and the most important, which I just said, they targeted developer community. 
the community who was already very well educated, who knew what's happening, and they can start using the product. They fill the gap instead of creating something, uh, a new idea which otherwise can be done using fiat. I'm not saying that Constam token, their services can still not be accessed through uh, fiat for big enterprises, but for the developer community, it was much more faster and easy just to use tokens and get that effect. So. These are those products. Now, even after, since Constam till today, we ourselves are now facing issues to actually invest into tokens with the company where we feel like we are going to have a network effect with this. We haven't done. Actually, we have been stuck to equity since then. Uh, so there are not a lot of products. There are not a lot of market fits available out there where we can say everybody is going to go just with tokens. Uh, and also, the crypto prices are not really helping for people to do. And legislation and regulation, and I completely agree uh, with Jay, we definitely need it. But so far, there is still not a concrete reality or a streamlined process that's, yes, let's do it. So. Adam, on your side, what projects have you either been involved in directly or are you most impressed with in terms of getting their tokens in the hands of authentic users? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's really tough. I think that <clears throat> from a regulatory perspective, SEC commentary comes out and says, you know, if you don't want to be considered a security, there needs to be some level of uh, utility associated with your platform. You know, they went and said that Ethereum theoretically maybe started as a security, but then reached a level of decentralization so much so that you're no longer dependent on a single body with information asymmetries to <clears throat> have you know massive impact on on how you know price is going to fluctuate or what's going to happen with the project. So a lot of uh, founders are incentivized to say, hey, um, you know, if I want to get listed on Huobi or Bitrix, I need to launch my smart contracts right away. I, it needs to be live. I need to show that there's utility associated with the project. Um, but then what? may end up happening is, is you sort of launch before you have product market fit, um, or you choose the wrong protocol, or you don't even realize that, you know, <laughs> you don't really realize how your burn is going to impact, you know, the, where your company is going to go, and you don't know if you can fundraise, and there's a host of issues. Um, so I think from our perspective, we always encourage um, our founders to sort of, you know, be slow and steady. I do think if you're in the sort of protocol race, and you're, you're trying to aggressively compete for developers, there's a... Uh, um, there's a bit of a push to try and get to market very quickly, but generally for most projects, um, you know, I'd, I'd much rather see a company have some real core technology innovation, um, raise equity, start a little bit slower, and then if there's a true opportunity to throw gas on the fire and you think that you can raise non-dilutive capital in the form of a security token or utility token, you know, by all means, go for it. Um, you know, I think I think for us in terms of our the projects that we invest in. So obviously we focus on, on the infrastructure layer because we think that just crypto generally is very early, so we want to sort of own the pipes um, that can power this ecosystem. Um, and that can, that can be you know, investing in institutional exchanges or smart contract auditors or layer two scaling solutions. Um, but in terms of, of sort of like um, you know, projects that are really trying to get their tokens in the hands of many, many consumers, um, it's very, very difficult. I mean, you can actually see um, how these dApps are used, and there's not a lot of usage. Um, you know, I think for us, one of the spaces that we think is going to facilitate sort of broad-based consumer adoption in a very easy way is, is through gaming. Um, because from our perspective, you know, you had $80 billion spent in free-to-play mobile. You've got Gen Zs and millennials that are used to the buying and selling and trading of digital assets. Um, so we think that with a sort of simplistic UI UX and, and NFTs, it, it's a great way to sort of allow players to have sort of ownership of the economies that they invest in. So um, we definitely think that, that gaming is, is, is a, a big part of our portfolio in terms of how to get broad-based user adoption. Um, but honestly, you know, it's, it's very difficult if, if the goal is how many projects you know, in your portfolio right now have you know, thousands and thousands of users. It's not a lot because we're just really, really early. So there's been increasing uh, signal or noise, not sure which one, over the last six months around launching these projects without having the fundraise tied to the token. Um, have you been involved, you know, much like the original Bitcoin, right? Let's, they didn't sell the tokens. You had to mine them to get them. Uh, you have to do something. Uh, there's a term out there. I think it's U-stress, E-U stress. Look it up. It's, uh, it's basically useful stress uh, to be able to get access to something, a hurdle to jump through. Uh, I've seen some of the recent consensus projects like Foam Protocol require uh, folks, uh, to uh, in this case, to buy tokens, I believe they had to 
you know, perform some work, but there's, you know, there's a lot of conversation out there around something called generalized mining. I don't know if that's popping up for you guys. Um, maybe, um, Kavita, if you could just kind of talk about what that is and how that might be used to launch tokens, token ecosystems. So staking, basically, yeah. most of the time. Uh, so I think SEC came out and said that if it's a utility token, why are investors investing in it? So as an, as an investor, even for us, if I buy, let's say, Foam token, taking that example, which was launched by Token Foundry from Consensus, uh, I'm not going to use it for geographical mapping. Like, I'm not going to use all the tokens to stake on the network, to increase the network effect, and like keep on staking as any sort of incentives. So if as an investor I want to get into a utility token, I really have to show the use case for it. So whether I show the use case of it by saying that I'm going to distribute it to my investors, or sorry, my portfolio companies to use it, or I basically say, hey, I'm going to take the node of one of the nodes of uh, foam token and do the governance around it as an investor. So I get to have like a governance node out of it where I can stake all the tokens which I have and the other people come on it and that's my network effect to it. So somebody or the other have to show the utility of a system around it. So staking has become a very big one. Like computational folk uh, uh, projects, you can go and you can say, hey, I'm building a, I'm gonna keep the hardware where I'm gonna stake a lot of tokens on it and show the utility. So general mining of like moving from uh, cryptocurrency, it is moving towards token, uh, token mining, uh, where a lot of foundations of the projects are allowing you to start staking your tokens or burn your tokens based on how do you use that? It's a very interesting concept which came and a couple of funds have tried. Uh, I'm not sure. I think primarily because of there's not much utility tokens going and the prices are down, I'm not sure is it coming mainstream. Like we haven't done it so far. Thank you. Um, Chase, uh, from your perspective in the space, uh, earlier you sort of indicated a, a, a hyper focus around Bitcoin. Um, what else are you looking at? I'm curious from your perspective, what do you see as kind of the most overhyped concept right now in the market, as well as really the most overlooked concept in the market? Fundamentals is the most overlooked. Um, and, you know, probably against well, what... Tell us what kind of fundamentals. Well, what just do you look basic, at? Well, so I got to speak actually not too long ago at an event where the average investor had $100 million in play in some sort of an asset, not crypto. And... I, I realized that the same fundamentals that built their funds to where they are, they forgot about six months into it. And they're talking to me about metrics and things and how it's not working. And I'm like, but you're a three to five year play. Like the fundamentals aren't there. Like this is hyper exposed and it's all over social media. Okay. So like fundamentals have to be played 100% because this is being run by emotions right now. And emotional control is hyper, hyper key in being successful in any world market. How about a relationship that's not focused? How's that go for you? Terrible. So like, I truly believe that people aren't, are, need to take a step back and realize you're here. Step one, good job. We're still at step one. It doesn't matter if your mom or your aunt or a friend you know has made 100 million bucks, it's irrelevant. You need to be focused on what your fundamentals are. So the basics, education. Know the field you're playing in. And if you think right now, oh, I gotta quick do it before all the really you know, big sharks get in, you're, you're, you're delayed on the action, they're here and they're already augmenting it. The things that I'm very scared about is ICOs. Um, I truly believe you know, companies like yourselves are, are the backbone of smart ones, but there are so much shit out there that it's convoluting everything up. And I can't talk enough about this. Like, do you know what you get when you invest in an ICO? Does anybody know what you get? Nine times out of 10. Fairy dust, right? Hope that eventually it'll become somewhere, you know? Like, and that scares me because normally in my business world, what I've seen, the most scrappy and best people, they fought through their way. And the problem with social media now is you have a good idea and a really good narrative, you can sell anybody anything. And I know this for a fact because a lot of the ICOs have used our marketing company, which we've recently stopped allowing it to happen because you can write any narrative. I can get everybody in this room confidently to buy something. I'm very confident in that because I can pick at things that will make you either be emotional with it or hate the op opposing side of it. So I just want people to really, really hone in on the fundamentals. I always say this, take a very small amount of money so that you are incentivized to be educated. 
from that small amount of money, you'll find what your path is. There's a lot of intelligence. These people probably hold the intelligence on their pinky than I hold in my whole body in this space. But I was successful because I have a very focused thesis. And that is understanding people and interactions to money. Everyone wants more and they want it as fast as it can possibly come. Realizing that will make you a, a million steps ahead of everybody else. So fundamentals, please everyone. Otherwise, you're going to keep making us all rich. Following up on what you said there, Chase, uh, on ICOs, um, uh, Adam, you're well-networked. You're actively investing in these projects. Um, wh what are investors' minimum requirements for these? Uh, are, 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 is your network investing in ICOs with no rights right now, or is it equity? Yeah. What does so, that look like? Uh, what's yeah, the minimum so, requirement? Uh, what's interesting for us, and you know, obviously we're very, very deep in crypto, but we come from venture capital. So we're constantly looking at fundamentals. We're constantly looking at founders with real sort of information asymmetries, that there's something unique in their background that makes us confident that they can do something special. Um, you know, even at the seed stage when you're investing, I still want to see some sum and some product market fit, unit economics, something that I can actually look at to understand if your business has product market fit and if your business even makes sense for the hyper growth that's required if you're trying to go big in the crypto space or go big in the, in the venture space. Um, I definitely think that now if you, um, if you take the pulse of, uh, of a lot of investors, at least in the crypto spaces, they all now look at like equity as a way for them to get you know, the downside protection that they wish they had uh, you know, when there was a, a macro regime change and everybody lost um, a lot of money. Um, but from our perspective, you know, we sort of want those rights and privileges no matter what. If, if I'm investing with a company and they want me to sign a SAF that looks like a contract of adhesion, which basically means you have all the rights and I have none, um, that's not going to be a healthy relationship. So um, we're, we're actually really pleased when um, you sort of have a macro shift and people think, oh, it's now a bear market, because for us, that plays right into what we're good at. Um, you know, we're business builders. We care about fundamentals. So, so generally, um, what we're noticing is, you know, companies are coming out, instead of trying to raise $50 million, they're trying to raise, you know, one to three million. They're actually offering equity. They're also offering a pro rata portion, a pro rata right to their tokens, assuming they ever do a sale as a byproduct of your ownership in the company, and then you're able to negotiate, you know, for specific rights and privileges like liquidation preferences and pro rata rights and voting rights and things like that. Um, so from our perspective, we think that's really healthy. Um, we think whether it's crypto or or anything. Um, you should be investing in companies where you as an investor have rights and privileges and you're actually incentivized to care about the company and work with them. You're here. Thank you, Adam. Morgan, you've built a number of businesses. Um, let's just say I'm one of those folks. I've got my white paper and it's just me. I don't have my team together yet. Um, what's your, you know, I don't have token, uh, I don't have any sort of uh, unit economics. I certainly don't have product market fit. Morgan, what would be your advice to the, to the entrepreneur on building their team? You know, it's the, kind of that classic where you, you see kind of a shining star, but they, it's just them. They need more. How you do they build do, it? You need to do your proper research. You need to put the good management and the good teams together. Is right now you have a bad connotation from all of these ICOs. It's created a negative space, and a lot of this fluff is really gonna dissipate. What you have to do right now is then take the best of the best, the people who are going to survive through this bust, if you will, of part of this industry and, and rise above that, taking these teams and finding things that have the proper platform, the proper white papers that are really based upon a brick and mortar, based upon the fundamentals and a foundation for you to grow the business properly. Thank you for that, Morgan. Uh, we're, we're out of time. Uh, real quick, uh, I want each of you to, uh, to tell the audience kind of Who's your sort of number one person you're following on Twitter right now who's uh, uh, providing uh, the most insights? Uh, can't be anyone in your company or in your family. Why don't you go ahead, Morgan, and we'll just come down the way. Well, I was going to say you, but uh, probably a little biased. Um, <laughs> I'll I'll say Foz Ventures on uh, Twitter, <laughs> uh, guys. I'd, I'd probably say the people who have experience in the internet age of the bust and the booms, uh, those people who've had that experience, you know, have the proper foundation for us to be able to utilize that for what we're going through now. A uh, few names that probably come to mind would be... Just one. Just one? Pick one. Oh, man. Uh, I'd say Fred Krueger. Fred Krueger. Awesome. Adam. Yeah, I think uh, for us, um, we really enjoy speaking with sort of the Sand Hill Road uh, VC funds that have billions of dollars. They have all the management fees. They don't need to come into crypto. Um, but you notice a few of their partners sort of really going deep and understanding that 
you know, this is, this is potentially the next wave of, of computing generally. So um, I think for us, we've been really impressed uh, with the guys at Bain Capital, um, specifically Salil. Um, he's been doing a lot of strong investing. Um, and we like seeing sort of hyper pedigreed names actually putting their money where their mouth is and coming into this asset class and, and taking a risk. Jay? I'm one of these people, I, I don't have the focus in terms of Twitter. I follow so many people, <laughs> but I think I agree with you so much, you're going to be the person I'm going to follow. Oh, Twitter. Dear. What can I say? Awesome. <laughs> Chase, who are you following? Joseph. Joseph Holm. I mean, uh, you know, I'm following people who have their finger on the pulse. I like the people who lay the field for all of us to have a fair chance to play the game, to get suited up and to jump in the fun. So. Joseph, I mean, that's just, it's amazing. I, you know, I want to, you know, I, I want to say y'all should give yourself a round of applause for showing up and like doing these things, putting effort in, like it's a huge thing. I really, it's huge. Kavita, I love seeing Kavita, it. Kavita, last words, who are you following? Um, not biased, but Joseph Lubin, of course, because it's always about something happening in the ecosystem. But apart from that, I really love Sergey Brin's Twitter account. Like, I just can't get... <laughs> <laughs> over it. Like, who's, who's the name? Sergey Brin. So, yes. Yeah. Okay, great. <laughs> there's always something Wonderful. interesting out there. Cool. Uh, my name is, uh, there's a guy named Simon Dilarov. He's uh, doing a lot of writing around curation markets and token curated CCR, registries. Yeah. Uh, check him out. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thanks uh, for my esteemed panel uh, thank you. colleagues here. Thank you.